to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners from around the world. Uh, today I'm uh, joined by three top quality coaches. Uh, Jan van Loon, head of coaching at FC Utrecht. Greg Broughton is Academy Director, Bodo Glimt, Norway. And Paolo Miljevic Bakia uh, is a technical director of the under 12s, under 14s at Inter Milan Academy. Um, before I uh, introduce you properly to the uh, three guys, I just want to share my screen with you and give you a, a few more details on today's discussion on creating grassroots networks that support player and coach development. So as always, would like would love you to uh, sort of filter in your your questions to the guys using the Q&A tab at the, uh, down at the, the bottom of your, your Zoom screens um, to sort of help filter those questions into the right sort of sections of the, of the discussion. Uh, we'll have a, the discussion will be as follows. So we'll sort of have a focus on the uh, grassroots networks themselves uh, in the presentations, how they look at each of the uh, three clubs and, and a little bit on how they've evolved from where they were maybe four or five years ago to the direction the guys are, are taking those uh, networks in at this moment in time. Then for the second part, we'll sort of focus then more in, on the work that they're doing within the clubs with that development, how the player pathways from the grassroots into the academies works. And then also uh, sort of specifically on the, the coach education. What are the challenges of sharing a, a methodology with, with, with other coaches? those who are possibly working outside of your, your own sort of official club name. Um, and then and also the, the approaches to that. But uh, so we can get, get in deep to that, that detail, let me uh, stop sharing this screen and uh, start introducing you to the guys. So uh, first of all, I'll uh, bring in Jan van Loon, who's head of coaching from FC Utrecht, Jan. You, uh, you look as if you're, you're, you're in the office today. Yes, absolutely. Uh, behind me, uh, you see all the, yeah, the, the, the learning vision of, uh, of our academy. And this is um, um, where I work where from uh, every day. <laughs> so I'm uh, watching outside and I see our uh, stadium. So everything between the pathway from, let's say, the region into the academy, into the stadium. That is something we want to view every, uh, every day out at work and want to, want to improve that. Okay, I know, uh, yeah, it's be your third time, I believe, with us on the, on the Sunday session. So but, uh, for those of us who are those of us out there who, who may not have seen you on here before, just to give us a, a sort of a brief sort of summary of your, your footballing journey, where you've, where you've worked, where you've coached, Okay, so um, I started uh, 35 years ago as um, an 18-year-old uh, coach at um, PSV Eindhoven. Um, I worked there for six years, was very interesting because at that time the club developed from a more regional club to the national top and later even uh, European uh, awareness. Um, after that, I uh, worked for the Dutch FA as a regional uh, coach and later on uh, also for the, uh, for the national uh, um, office in, in, in Zeist. And I was um, very much involved with the development of the courses, especially the starting courses for coaches, for coach development. The start of the the national uh, teams, so let's say from under 12 into the under 15, under 16 uh, groups, boys and girls. And um, also, how do we get all different um, participants uh, in, in football? After that, I was a 10 years academy manager at uh, Willem II in Tilburg, uh, where Players like Virgil van Dijk and Frankie de Jong had their 10-year uh, academy time. And afterwards, they, uh, they went on. Um, after that, uh, I made a step to England, to the UK, uh, working for Arsenal as uh, head of uh, individual player uh, development. 
Then I was uh, at Wolfsburg in Germany as an um, opponent analysis. And this is my third season at FC Utrecht uh, as a head of coaching. All right, fantastic. Thanks, thanks, Jan. We'll uh, sort of get back to you in a in a moment and sort of learn a little bit more about your your work at FC Utrecht and, and specifically with the with the grassroots network. Um, so I'm going to now move on and sort of uh, bring in Paolo Magdavecchia, his um, technical director for the uh, under 12s under 14s at at Inter Milan. Uh, Paolo, how are, how are you today? Good. It's, it's not a normal Sunday because during the last period uh, uh, we have no football during the weekends here in Italy uh, for the COVID situation, but we try to get stronger and uh, have a positive plan for the future. And uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you for this invitation because it's always nice and interesting to discover and share uh, all about football for the grassroots level, but for everything. So for me, it's always a, a pleasure to participate of this of this event. Yeah, I'm sure sort of aspects of how the COVID problems is, is, is affecting your work and obviously sort of remaining connected with the players, with the other coaching staff. We can get into that, but I just wondered, first of all, just to tell us a little bit about your 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 coaching background leading up to your current role at, at Inter? Okay, I, I worked for Inter uh, during the last uh, 16 years. Uh, I, I started my career as a coach very young when I was 18 in a non-professional club and during uh, the next 60 years I, I tried to learn and develop uh, everything about uh, this uh, beautiful, beautiful job. And uh, 16 years ago, I, I had the opportunity to enter in this club in Inter Milan, like a, a normal, a normal coach for the for a new project that burn uh, in that period for the for the soccer school. And uh, in the next five years, uh, I work uh, in the grassroots level for the soccer school, and uh, I start to assist them all the coaches for the grassroots level. Uh, until six years ago, I have a coach and a coach for the grassroots teams, uh, like under 13, 12, 11, and the others. And uh, six years ago, the, our director gave me the opportunity to enter in this new role, like now, for uh, help the, the technical director for the grassroots level to uh, have a relationship with all the teams, uh, with all the coaches, and uh, develop all the formation about the technical situation. So. I have the opportunity to work with a, a really uh, pro coach and uh, nice experience all around the world. Uh, so now we hope to come back to the normal life for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We hope we hope that for you and, and for everyone else out there as well. Um, Absolutely. And also, yeah, look forward to hearing your your work and experiences on over the years on on both sides of the of Inter Milan's grassroots network uh, in, a, in a moment. But uh, yeah, finally, with our third, third guest for today, um, to bring in Greg Broughton, the Academy Director at Bodo Glimpse. And yeah, how's, how's things with you today, Greg? Yeah, it's good. Firstly, it's a uh, very honour to be in a room with uh, representing a small club here in the north of Norway with two such big clubs representing the Netherlands and, and Italy. Um, but it's, uh, it, it could be, I don't want to tempt fate, but it could be a historic day for Buda Glimt today because we play at eight o'clock this evening away against Strumsgood set. And if we get a point this evening, then we win the league for the first time in the club's history. In fact, for the first time that any club in the north of Norway has ever won the top division in Norway. And that's based with a team with players that we'll come on to later that have come through our grassroots section, come through the academy. So it's a, it could be a very special day, Steve, or it could be a terrible day, depending upon the result this evening. Well, our fingers, um, across, yeah. our fingers are crossed for you. And yeah, very honoured that you've decided to at least spend the, uh, the <laughs> first part of what could be a, a historic day with us. Um, obviously, a lot of people be aware, though, that your your footballing career, the coaching didn't begin in the north of Norway. So uh, sort of share with us this uh, amazing route that's sort of taking you up towards the uh, Arctic Circle. Yeah, you know, I've been here for three years now, um, but a, a, a little bit like both Jan and Paolo said earlier, my, my coaching career started quite early. I figured out that I wasn't going to be good enough to be a footballer 
when I was when I was quite young. So I started coaching when I was 16 in a grassroots club. Uh, had the opportunity to study sports psychology, and then wasn't sure whether I wanted to go into football or into athletics, into track and field, because I loved football with a passion and felt that if I was working in it, I might love, lose lose a little bit of love for it. But I did fall into it, and I started my first full time job uh, in the UK was with a very small club called Rushton and Diamonds. They're a new club uh, and I joined them in the fifth division in the UK and we worked our way up to the third division. Um, but our job, it was a, because it was a brand new club, it was owned by the guy who owns Doc Martin's Boots. Uh, he'd built an amazing stadium, amazing training facility, but we had to build the academy and that, we had a great team of coaches around us with the first team being led by Barry Hunter, who's now the head of first team scouting for Liverpool. Uh, Jeff Harrop, who is uh, now the head of loans for Southampton. Terry Wesley, who went on to manage the academies at West Ham, Derby and many other big clubs. So um, really, really good learning curve for me for my first job. And we were lucky we had players like Ben Chilwell, who's now obviously at Chelsea in England, uh, come through our foundation phase at nine to 12. Then I got a ch chance to join my hometown club, Luton, which was the club I grew up supporting, uh, initially as the head of academy recruitment and then as academy director for, for six years. Uh, the opposite right to, to the one at Rushton, because I joined them in the championship in England. And then for financial irregularities, we had three straight relegations down to the fifth division. So towards the end of my time there, it was just trying to keep the academy together um, because we had a lot of boys who were being tempted to go and train at other clubs. Um, and, and we had to just really fight to try and keep the whole thing alive whilst the first team had to try and battle back into the league. And then in 2012, I got the opportunity to join Norwich City. Uh, again, initially as head of player recruitment and then as academy director and had five years at Norwich, a really, really good five years. Uh, although we bounced in and out of the Premier League during that period, we were able to build a really firm base with the academy. And a lot of the players who are in their first team or have had moves this summer came through the programme that I was very uh, lucky to be part of during that time. Uh, and then we just fancied a change, my family and I, an, an adventure. And we really, really wanted to come to Scandinavia. Uh, we didn't really know where and we talked to one or two other clubs, but the project didn't really uh, didn't really make me motivated to do that big family move. And when I talked to the guys here at Buddha Glimpse, because I didn't even know where Buddha was, as I'm sure most people listening today probably don't know where Buddha is on a map of Norway. And when we saw, um, OK, that's really far north, it's, it's inside the Arctic Circle. So we had to come and visit as a, as a family and decide if that was right for us. And but it was the project really that, that lit my fire and they really wanted to be adventurous and they believed in the generations of players they had not about to break into the first team. So, but to sit here three years later and to have played at the San Siro this year in the Europa League and to have obviously uh, now be on the verge of winning the league, it's been an it's been an amazing ride for the for this period. Oh, fantastic! Um, well, I don't think we can hold uh, that excitement back for any longer. So I'll, I'll allow you to. Uh, to share your screen first and, and tell us a little bit more yeah. about the, the grassroots project at, uh, at Boda Glimt. Yeah. Good. Well, um, I think it's important to, to set the context firstly, and the context and the geography of the north of Norway is quite unique. So I thought I'd start with a very basic geography lesson for everybody. But that obviously Buda there on the, in the picture on the left-hand side is up inside the 200 kilometers above the Arctic Circle. And there are only two clubs in the north of Norway, us and Tromsø are our local rivals. And unfortunately they got relegated last year. Although luckily for us, they're gonna bounce back, it looks like today and win, uh, win promotion back to the top series. But if you then go to the map on the right, that's the geography of our county, the county of Norland. Um, and if you look, the geography is challenging. It's islands, it's lakes, it's fjords, it's mountains, it's sea, it's rough weather, it's snow. So, so the context is very, very different to the context I've been working in previously, and I'm sure very different to the context at, at Inter Milan or at Utrecht. But that's some of the geographical challenges that we face as a football club. Just to give you an idea of distances, to drive from Andernes in the north of, of, uh, of our county to Brunnesen in the south, it's about a 12 hour drive and that includes ferries. So if you get a rough sea day, that could take a lot longer than 12 hours. To try and put that into context, it's roughly the same distance in, in kilometers as Milan to Napoli and same distance in terms, of, uh, in terms of driving distance as Utrecht to Milan. So just to try and bring, bring the clubs together to give an idea of geography. But 
the north of Norway is a very, very special place. But until the 1970s, the north of Norway was looked down on by the rest of the country. We, we weren't allowed to participate in the National League. North Norwegians weren't allowed to stay in hotels in Oslo. And there was a discrimination against people from the north, as, as there are in many countries. But Glimt were one of the first few clubs to be allowed into the National League in 73. And two years later, in 75, we won the cup for the first time. Uh, and therefore, the, the place of Buda Glimt for people from the north of Norway is very, very special. Even, even the, the fans of our local rivals won't admit it publicly, but today we'll watch with joy, I'm sure, as, uh, if, if we are able to go on and represent the north by winning the league. But to give an overview of the club, the club runs two parallel parts. So the other big difference, especially for me working in the UK my whole career before that, is academy football in Norway doesn't start till 13. That's the rule. And even that rule has only been placed for five or six years. Uh, before that, it was 16. So it was a controversial and a much debated uh, move to start academy football at the age of 13. But within our club, uh, all football before 13 is within a grassroots section, the six to 12. And we have about four teams per age group, about 40 players per age group. And then at 13, we take out the first academy group of, of only around 12 players. And I'll explain the reason why it's such a small number in a second. And at the same time, then, the, the grassroots section runs its own programme all the way up to 19. Uh, and we would then run five squads within the academy, 13s, 14s, 15s, 17s and 19s. Um, again, just to give some context to the academy programme, um, at 11 and at 12, we run two parallel programs supplemented by Talent ID, where we have a development centre that anybody from the city can come and train in, running twice a week. But then we also have what we call the BLARG, and the translation being the city group, where we bring together the players with the most promised age 11 or 12. So around 50 players from across the city and the, 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 the small section of the county that our city lives in. And those players we coach, but we also ask all of the coaches from, from their own parent clubs to be part of those sessions. So we plan them. We then sit down and discuss the planning before the sessions start. And then we deliver that as a, as a club supported by our partners. But because of the geography, we run shadow squads at 13s, 14s and 15s within the academy. But they're not like shadow squads that I would know, having worked in the UK before, where they'd come together once a week to train because any member of that shadow squad might li live at one end of that map or the other end of that map, 12 hours apart. So it's our job to educate those players in, on an individual basis, or maybe two players within a club. And then every two weeks when we play in the National League, uh, and I'll bring the league system into it in a second, when we play in the National League, the Federation pays for all of those players to travel into our city, and they arrive by plane, by train, by boat, by car on a Friday, we train together Friday evening, Saturday, play the game Sunday, and then fly home or go home by the same method of transport on Sunday night. So our academy squad has a core group of 12 players from within the city, but then roughly 16 players from outside the city um, who, who are training at any one stage. And then the league programme runs up the right-hand side of the screen there. So you'll see a, a G13 or under 13, uh, we play only within a local series, uh, up one year or two years, but then also complement that with eight to 10 national or international tournaments. And then the national series starts at 14. Uh, at 17, well, un uh, under 16 for high school, all of our players come full time into our school program. So the 40 players in the top two yellow boxes would all be part of our school program on a full time basis, uh, which obviously makes the day to day coaching a lot easier at, at 16 onwards. So that's the, co the context to, to paint the picture, really. And then running alongside that, we have uh, what they call in Norway the Kretz program, which is the national selection program, which also starts at under 13. So we facilitate that here within the county, working with the county football association. And our target by February each year is from the north of Norway to have nominated five players at each age group to go into the national training camp um, uh, within Oslo, where, where the national selectors will then begin to take players out at under 15 for their national teams. On the left hand side of the screen there is, is the 20 partner clubs that work with us within the county of Norland. Um, uh, 20 might not seem very, very many and I guess for some clubs when I talk to the guys from Jetland in Denmark and they have 100 partner clubs, 20 isn't very many, I understand that. But the geography of the, of the north of Norway as I've said is unique, there are only 250,000 people 
living within the county of Norland. So there aren't hundreds of football clubs to be working with. But what does the, what's it look like for those 20 clubs? Well, that gives us access to around 3,000 junior players, boys and girls. Uh, but, uh, and all of those clubs are only volunteers. None of those clubs would have a paid coach within their youth section. But to be a partner club here with Buddha Glimt, they have to have the charter standard, as it would be called in the United Kingdom, or the quality club, as it is called here in Norway, from the Football Association. And to have that, they have to have a coach developer within their club. So one of our main jobs is to affect that coach developer, because to try and affect all of the coaches within a club is difficult. And we need to try and affect the coach developers first. So on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis, what might that look like for the partner club? Well, for the clubs outside of the city, we would visit them twice a year. What we've found during this lockdown period, though, is we've done a lot of webinars, as we were talking about just before we came on camera today. And what we've now found is that as people have got more used to using Zoom or Teams, that has now began to say, do we need to get in a car six hours to go and visit that club as regularly as we have done before? It can't replace it, certainly, because those personal connections are irreplaceable, but it can complement it. And now we are looking, regardless of what happens in the world next year, that the place of the webinar now will definitely supplement what we're doing with our partner clubs. We also send them two age-specific session plans per week for them to use or to take parts of or to discuss within their clubs. And as I've said at the bottom there, we have webinars as well. For our partner clubs that are closer to home within an hour, we offer a weekly in-service for coaches. So here within the stadium once a week, we put on a session for coaches and invite a specific club to bring their team in to work with. And then we work with them very closely on a talent ID basis. When you've got such a small, small pool of players, you have to work with the clubs. You can't presume as you sometimes might do within the UK market that you can just go and take the best two players from a team you have to have much stronger relationships with the clubs. And then my final slide today is really just to talk about some of the players that have come through that program um, over the last 10 years. So on the left-hand side of the screen would be three of the players who are no longer at the club. Matthias Norman at the top, uh, who moved to Brighton in 2016 and is now at Rostock, uh, a member of the Norwegian national team. In the second picture on the left, next to uh, Holland is, is uh, Håkan Evian. Uh, Hawken moved to Alkmaar in January and Hawken made his debut for the Norwegian national team under unusual circumstances during the week. And then finally, Jens Petter Hauger, uh, who again uh, played for us until September this year before moving to Milan after the Europa League game. Um, all of those three players have come through our partner club system. Matthias joined us from Leckness, which is in the Lofoten Islands, just off the coast at 16. Hawken Evian from Narvik, which is five hours north, again at the age of 16. Jens Petter came in at 13. He was with a local club in the city up until the age of 12. Also on the right-hand side of the screen are two players who will feature for us tonight. Ulrich, who's the captain of the team, and Isaac Amundsen, age 20, who will make his probably his first start tonight in the Elite Syrian. Uh, both of those players come from Brunnison, which was the point at the very south of the map I showed you. And then finally, three players who are in our club right now or in our team right now, Patrick Berg, Frederick Andre and Morten Conradsen. And they all came through the grassroots section within our own club. And obviously, we have to influence those coaches within our own club as well as those outside the club. But that's just to kind of give a very brief overview and hopefully put a context on it in terms of the geography and some of the challenges we have working with our partner clubs here in the north of Norway. Fantastic. Thanks, Greg. It's a yeah, really, really nice introduction to, uh, yeah, so certainly the uh, geographical challenges you're, you're playing with at, uh, at Bodo Glimt and, and obviously by the sounds of it, some, some of the successes you're having as well. Mm. Uh, but obviously, yeah, we'll get into all of that a little bit deeper in a moment. Um, sort of, uh, sort of see, uh, bring in Paolo, uh, allow Paolo to share some of the details of, of how into Milan, interact with their with their grassroots network. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to start to show how is everything about our 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 club with with all the academy, with all the youth sector. 
and these are the number of composers for uh, uh, all the lead teams in Milan, that more or less 1,700 players, uh, with 24 teams uh, composed by male and female teams, because uh, uh, obviously we, we always start with, uh, with the men's teams, starting with under nine to under 19, but during the last five, six years, uh, we compose uh, all the system about the female uh, structure and uh, is composed everything uh, from under nine, the youngest, uh, until the, the first team. So during the, the last years, uh, we have a, a really uh, big structure and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of players that play with us. Um, in Italy, we try to always uh, uh, build uh, a, a technical project, uh, and uh, you show here with, uh, with these numbers, so with uh, um, with the grassroots level. Uh, because uh, for us it's really important to base everything uh, with this uh, with this structure. So uh, at the beginning uh, we just have uh, uh, five or six uh, teams, uh, but uh, during the last years uh, we try to compose uh, more of uh, 400 players. Uh, so for men and women, uh, we have uh, 16 teams uh, because uh, special in the in the in the male groups we we compose uh, two groups. Uh, so a big group that split in two starting with under, with under 10, under 11, because for our, for our it's very, really important uh, to have uh, a really more passion uh, to arrive uh, for the next step, uh, for, uh, for the agonistic level, for under 15, and try to develop uh, every player that we choose during the, best, the, 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 the first selection. For the technical project, we start to build three different technical projects. So this one, the CDF, uh, moving uh, in all the country, and uh, we, we start in our region here in Lombardia, uh, close to, to our city, Milan, but we try to develop all this uh, grassroots uh, project uh, to try to transfer and try to create a copy of our facility. So this project is just for the, for the grassroots level. Our, our technical staff uh, is a support for this club. It's a non-professional club. And uh, this club are composed by seven in our region, in Lombardia, and the others in the other region. And uh, every, every club is a, a sort of a technical director. It's come from our, our club, which is our Inter, Inter Milan uh, um, coach. For uh, this, uh, this, the second project uh, is called um, Inter Grassroots Program. It's sort of a, a, an upgrade of uh, an old project that is called uh, for the affiliates club. Uh, we always uh, create a sort of a technical support. We try to transfer our methodology. We try to uh, check uh, all the territory around the club. It's always not professional club. It's always based uh, the focus on uh, grassroots level. This, the last one, the soccer school, uh, is, a, is a normal soccer school like uh, all the clubs uh, usually have inside. So starting with the youngest players, uh, starting from eight, five year, years old, arrive at seven. And uh, all the players, all the family, they want to uh, participate of this soccer school uh, they to can. And uh, it's important because uh, he composed this one. So a sort of... Uh, Sorry, okay. Uh, it's sort of a pyramid. So we start with the soccer school, the base, then we arrive on the grassroots level, they arrive in the training center, CDF, and then we have the elite teams. And this is important for us because uh, every player try to have uh, an opportunity to arrive in our elite teams. And uh, our technical staff and scouting staff try to check and control everything during every sports season. And uh, the players, uh, the best expression of talent uh, is left through the, this pyramid network in Italy. So it's a growing up and we always uh, growing together. These uh, are uh, the, the topics of uh, our technical project. So uh, try to transfer our methodology, uh, especially for the grassroots level, try to direct monitoring players' development, uh, starting with the youngest arrival until under 14, because our grassroots level is composed uh, from this, uh, these teams, uh, and the oldest uh, are uh, the under 14. Because uh, here in Italy, when uh, all the clubs arrive for under 15, change something about uh, the Italian Rules Federation. 
for example, uh, we can uh, take the players that come from other region during the under 15 moment. Uh, they enter in the agonistic and the national group and they play the national championship. Uh, we have uh, some players that come from uh, other region that live together in our villas, in our building and stay together, to go, go to school together. Uh, sometimes made the training section during the morning and the normal training in the afternoon. So changing something. So for us, it's really important the base, the grassroots level. And during the last uh, uh, 10 years, more or less, uh, we arrive uh, on this percentile. So these three, so more or less 40% uh, arrive from this technical project. So for us, uh, it's really important to continue to develop and, and share with uh, all the clubs that want to work with us, work with our uh, academy. For the seconds, I, I want to show you the grassroots targets for us for really important because uh, for the general targets, uh, all, the, all the clubs uh, work in this direction and try to run and develop and growing up with the coaches, with the technical staff. So for the motivational target, for the technical target, and for the individual and collective ta uh, tactical target uh, as uh, is the normal target for everyone. But, uh, it's really important to work in this direction with a high intensity, with a specific uh, exercise uh, and with uh, small groups uh, with the specific coaches. Then for the other side on the right, we work in the coordinated targets with the defensive special because we have a, a, a coach that collaborates with us that uh, work in that direction, not just for the tactical, but just for the in individual technical for all the players, not just for the defenders because we are always in the grassroots level. And then the other, the last, the last two, it's uh, insert during the last years, the football. So the futsal is, a, is a, a little bit different from normal football, but for us, it's important to transfer some, uh, um, some technical skills, especially for uh, 1v1, especially for the, uh, the technical or dribble the ball, and especially for the situation all around the pitch. In, uh, in a really short space, uh, we have no time uh, and uh, it's important for them to understand this and transfer in the normal football when they play 7v7, 9v9 or 11v11. And the last one is the bio bending. Uh, for us, it's a, it's a new project for the work in progress now. Uh, we, we hope to, to, to restart and develop this, uh, this kind of uh, target because uh, we think that, uh, especially during the, the last part of the grasses level, so under 13, under 14, there's a lot of uh, differences for the body structure, for the mentality, for the, uh, the technical purpose. And uh, we want to create, uh, during the, the normal training week, uh, a little group that try to uh, work in that direction. Why we try to arrive at the general targets? Because we want to solve in simple and complex situation proposals. So this is the base of the game situation. And all this system is in direction to help the player to solve the simple and complex situation. Uh, which is the role of the coach for us is really important. When, when I start in, a, in, a, in Inter Milan club, uh, we have a really little staff, but now after 16 years, we have a really big uh, technical staff that because we have uh, two groups of average, we have uh, uh, three different uh, specific coach uh, for futsal, for defensive life, for the bio bending. We have the uh, physical and coordinated coach uh, for that target. So the, the technical staff uh, is important. And our educational process is based on different teaching contents and methodology depending on the player's age. So uh, we always speak about grassroots level, but uh, it's completely different if we speak for an under nine level or under 13 or 14 level. So our coaches try to approach and need to follow three main skills. I wrote there: competence, experience, and empathy. And the last one, empathy, is really important because uh, the players uh, that we try to coach are really young. They change uh, during this period. And uh, an example: if a, if a young kid entered in our first selection under nine and arrive under fourteen, past six years, and during these six years, it's changing a lot changing for the technical skills, changing for the uh, coordinated skills, changing for the mentality and for the experience that we try to do uh, with the training, with the tournament, with the championship, with the test match, with the friendly match. 
And it's important that every coach try to transfer this empathy, try to transfer the experience and uh, all the targets they want to share all together for the players, for the young players. Uh, which are the, the training key points for us? Uh, technical, tactical, fast thinking, because now the, the modern football are really fast. If we imagine uh, a, a game of the first team now in 2020, and we compare with a, with a, a first game, a first team game, uh, I don't know, during the 80s, are completely different for the, for the speed, uh, for the intensity. Uh, we have always, we, we can speak always for the, for the best top players in the world, but uh, the, the speed, intensity and the, the transition are completely different. So we try to develop in this direction with, uh, with our players. So far thinking, decision making and confidence, confidence uh, for, uh, for every situation that you try to resolve, for every situation with the ball especially, but not without ball, because uh, sometimes happen that, okay, we lost the ball, but uh, suddenly we try to recatch and we try to impose a, a new action. So for us, for, uh, for the inter-technical staff, these key points are really, really important. And uh, at the end, so the, the, the last uh, uh, slide is uh, uh, our grass methodology. We try always to work in this direction, starting with up. So create an exercise from simple to complex and from unknown to unknown because it's important for the player to discover everything. Help uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the coach and uh, try to transfer all the, all the skills, uh, but uh, it's important that uh, the players are the protagonist. The intensity, because uh, I said before, uh, the, the fast thinking and decision making are really fast. Uh, try to always involve all players, uh, because uh, football is a, is a sport that will compose about a lot of people not just individual. So it's important to involve everything and every training try to create different groups and always the same because they are different. And uh, for the players, but just for the coach, it's true, it's important to listen, to see, to do for every exercise we try to propose. And uh, it's important for them because for the motivation is really important, the variety of proposal. Because uh, we always speak about football, we always speak about exercise uh, for the technical or tactical situation. But for them, it's important to discover everything and to vary everything around all uh, the formation. So these are a really, a really fast uh, show our 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 grasses level. Okay, Paolo. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Thank it's you. like a yeah, very comprehensive overview of the of the structure and the. And the methodology you share with with the, the clubs and the development centres within your your grassroots network. Obviously, we'll we'll get more into the details of, of how that that methodology is shared amongst all the coaches. Um, but first, uh, we'll bring in Jan van Loon for our final presentation for today and um, to give us an overview of of the grassroots network at FC Utrecht. All right. So, um, as you uh, maybe can see on my uh, chest, is that uh, our club uh, exists uh, this year, uh, the, the 50th uh, anniversary. So that means that the club is pretty young. And um, therefore, we... Um, we have a um, certain pathway that, that uh, made where we are standing now. And at this moment, uh, the club uh, is uh, trying to challenge the, the, the top three clubs in the Netherlands, like Ajax, Ajax Feyenoord, PSV. And um, in terms of uh, the, the, the certification of our academy, we have the international status, what is the highest in the Netherlands and is the same as those clubs. Um, so since um, uh, two and a half years, I'm the head of coaching. And as you see here, I'm at this moment, I'm really coaching, but most of the time I'm, I'm coaching the coaches. Um, and one of the things we also organized for our region is the 
FC Utrecht experience. I will explain later what that really means, but the general way is learn to play the FC Utrecht way. And um, if you uh, look at our vision at FC Utrecht, it starts with pleasure. Um, from pleasure, uh, it, uh, people get motivated, so they want to develop themselves. And at the end, of course, you have players who want to perform at the highest possible level. And we are, um, in this situation, we are the, the, the top of the pyramid in our region. So uh, Utrecht is a city, but at the same time also a province, the smallest province in the Netherlands. Um, and if you look here, we have around 200 amateur clubs, grassroots clubs in our region. And we have with 50% of those clubs, we have a relationship. And um, you see that are three levels. And we divided that in um, organizational uh, uh, level. Um, so that means a club who works on a day by day level. So that means when there is a problem, they solve it today and tomorrow they solve the problems again. Then you have more the short term development grassroots level. That means that they normally have a, a year program that things are organized and that they solve the problems more in a, in, in, in a little bit longer term. And then at the end, you have the, the long-term development grassroots level that are the bigger clubs who have an academy manager and, and have certain uh, coaches who are paid and have their licenses. And then at the end, you have the top of the pyramid and that is uh, where players and coaches are developed to a pro level. And you see with the arrows, you see that the philosophy is that everything affects everything. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, every talent, if it's a player or a coach, can start at any level. You never know where it starts. Uh, and we need each other. Uh, uh, one layer can't uh, deal with the other layer. We all have to support each other and, and, and uh, keep each other alive because that means that we can uh, play the nicest uh, competition matches and we can prevent the best uh, sort of uh, support and, 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 um, and training. One of the things I think it's very important to know in the Netherlands that um, when you look at um, uh, the way it's organized that every club has uh, its own uh, DNA. So it's often from, uh, from a child to a junior to senior, and then at the end you become a referee or coach or a member of the board or you sponsor the club. So it's, 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 it's a very much a family uh, way how clubs in the Netherlands are organized. Um, that means also that um, you can be a member of a club uh, 100 euros a year and that means you have two training sessions a week and one game in the weekend um, that is not much uh, uh, money um, and that means that there is a lot of participation so a lot of kids it's it's easy to go to a club it's it's very social it's very open and at the same time, not one of these clubs is exactly the same they all have their own DNA they the reason that they exist and the reason that they uh, uh, want to work on. They are proud of that DNA and um, that means that people look after the club. Uh, so that means that people take responsibility for the club, for the future of the club. And I think that is one of the most important uh, starting points that, uh, that we are working from. So if you look at uh, the left uh, picture, that is the Netherlands. Um, it's uh, yeah, 3000 uh, football clubs uh, in total. So that means that, that everywhere are a lot of football clubs, uh, smaller and bigger. Uh, on the right side, I, um, I, I made a picture of where FC Utrecht is with, with our facilities and our club and our stadium and our academy. But you see the bigger clubs are spread out. Um, 
back to the left one, if I would also put, let's say, Amsterdam and Rotterdam and Eindhoven and Arnhem, then you will see that when you are in the middle of the country, um, uh, it's easy for other clubs to uh, recruit the best players and the best coaches from our area. Um, on the other side, those three top clubs, they have supporters all over the country. And 99% of our supporters come from within our uh, city or within our province. So that means that it's, it's almost a su survival strategy that our relationship uh, between the club and the region is uh, essential. That's our survival strategy to, uh, to get everybody aligned and um, help everybody in all age groups. Um, on the other hand, of course, we have to focus. So if you look at uh, these uh, uh, bigger clubs, that are the 11 clubs who are in that uh, uh, top segment, and um, uh, they are well organized, beautiful facilities, they have a, a, a worked out program, they have an academy manager, they have um, a licensed coaches. Um, and now you see the step we made two years ago when uh, I started here, we said, okay, every coach at FC Utrecht is also a club coach. And we have 12 of them. So in this picture, you see the four clubs that I am a club coach. And that means that I uh, communicate on a regular basis with the academy manager of the club and the, uh, the coaches in the club. So we have WhatsApp groups. Um, we talk about uh, the things that happen at the club uh in terms of okay how can we help you to become the best form of yourself um and um in that way i also want to open up with um there is not one player in our academy who started at fc utrecht all the kids that play in 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 our academy all started with a grassroots uh club and from there they made uh by recruitment, they made a step to our club. Uh, but we have only five uh, scouts. So that means that all the, uh, the clubs who are aligned with us are also our scouts. Not only looking at who is good in their club, but also looking about, okay, who is good in, in, in other clubs and who is able to go to that next level. Now you can understand that if you have such, um, uh, let's say, um, a, a, a bound with your club, those clubs see their members as it's, it are their members. Uh, it are not customers, but they really are part of a family. So normally, if we uh, get a player from a grassroots level to our academy, then they see that as a lost. In this way, we see more and more that they see uh, that, uh, that the way we build the relationship between them and us, that they understand better what, what we do and that they uh, support us with our work and that they send the players that they think are good enough to go in the uh, recruitment system, that they can play for our club. Um, and uh, the youngest age group is our under eight. Um, and uh, that is um, an age group that we are uh, changing now to uh, later. So that means that we have now uh, 10 under eight players. And this morning we had uh, in four places in this region, we had a pre-academy with in total 80 players, eight zero players who all are trained every week uh, one time a week at our pre-academy, but still are a member of their club. So if we go next, then you see, oh, this is the whole region. Um, of course, I can't put in every club, but in total uh, uh, 200 plus uh, clubs. And we, uh, at this moment, we, um, uh, we can help 50% uh, uh, of that. And that amount of clubs is, is growing. Um, 
the most uh, what we want is of course that uh, uh, clubs uh, who are high in the pyramid that they at least stay there or they grow or clubs who are a little bit lower in the pyramid that they can grow to a higher level so uh, a green one can go into a blue one and a blue one can go into a pink one uh, so at the end we all want every kid to be in a club that they are served well and that they can um, get their personal highest level and some of them can also play in our academy teams and everybody will understand that if we have more players from our region the relationship with the region gets only better and um, at the same time uh, the, the, the spectators and the fans will see players from our region in our first team um, if we look at the FC Utrecht experience, we focus on everything before 11 v 11, so that means under 12 and younger, because we had to make that, that focus. Um, the FC Utrecht experience starts with an experience for players, so uh, uh, camps and clinics, um, and at the same time we do coach development. Um, and at the moment we do the coach development, we also do the club development. So that means that every time when we do an activity, it's all included. So we want uh, in our activities for players, we want uh, the coaches to develop and at the same time the club to develop. And we think if we work this out uh, every time that at the end, the level at the club will go to a higher level and the kids have a day by day better experience at those clubs. Um, at this moment, I said already, we have uh, 12 club coaches and in total we have uh, 22 clubs uh, who we can support uh, with a club coach. So that means the 11 uh, long term development clubs and another 11 who are in that lower layer, layer, but by our guidance, they can go up and then we can we can um, uh, improve the way the FC Utrecht club coaches are developing that and in the future they are able to, to uh, guide even more clubs to a higher level. Uh, back to uh, the first slide. So uh, when you are a head of coaching at FC Utrecht, you're not only responsible for everything that happens uh, in the club, but also what happens in the region. Um, and the last two years, we developed this uh, vision of club coach and, and, and uh, the FC Utrecht experience. And the guideline is uh, learn to play the FC Utrecht way. Uh, take from it what you want. Uh, be free to leave it and uh, get maybe just one thing out of it. Um, but working on the relationship with our du direct, very small region, that is uh, the focus for FC Utrecht at this moment. Brilliant, thanks Jan. Um, so I'm going to start, we'll sort of pick up on that relationship with, with, the, with the grassroots clubs in your region. Um, a lot of coaches working within grassroots and also a lot of the elite clubs will sort of point that there's always a, a clash there where the, the smaller clubs just view the involvement of the bigger clubs with a fair amount of skepticism that you're only coming here basically to steal our best players. If you're mentioning that you only have five scouts and these players are being filtered through to your club quite freely. So how have you developed that relationship over the last few years? Because I'm sure it probably wasn't always that comfortable where, where the clubs were, smaller clubs were welcoming you in with open arms. No, that's, that is exactly the case, uh, Steve. So two years ago, uh, we saw that more and more clubs were not happy anymore with that approach because exactly uh, what you explained. So uh, we take your best players and you get uh, 20 free tickets for, uh, for a game of the first team. And that was just too limited. It was limited thought, limited idea of uh, building a relationship together. And if you combine that with that 99% of our followers is from our direct region, uh, then we have to um, understand 
that that is our survival strategy. We have to uh, make a bond with those people and we are not the kind of people who say, uh, this is our vision, this is the best vision uh, that was ever there. Just, just take what you want, work from your personal DNA because that is of course something that fits to, uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, you don't tell a Dutch guy anything, uh, you, they, they decided themselves. Uh, the, we know how people in the world look at us <laughs> and I also know where it comes from. So that means that we want to help uh, those people with respect for their personal DNA and, 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 and uh, their survival uh, strategy. Um, but at the same time, they're also proud of the professional club in the region. And they are proud when they can bring a good player to FC Utrecht. And then FC Utrecht is proud when a player makes it from the academy to one of the top clubs or maybe even the national team. So, um, and that is, I think, is so beautiful of all these uh, stories also of, of uh, Greg and uh, Paolo, that, uh, yeah, you see, you want to, you want to make an impact. You you want to help people. You want to uh, you want to make an experience that they say, okay, I can dream of uh, that next level. Um, now and at this moment, um, we get more and more clubs who want to join us. Um, and then, of course, we have to look. Okay, can we do that within the uh, the people we have now? So um, this time. Uh, helps us to to uh, create that uh, relationship because yeah I'm not allowed to go in other clubs at this moment eh, because of the COVID uh, rules. Um, so also we have uh, found out that there are other ways to uh, to make that alignment. Uh, web webinars is one way, but also um, an app where uh, our uh, aligned clubs can find our way uh, of training sessions. So the coaches work out the training sessions of the under eight. They have a year plan. Uh, they can uh, look at that. That is videoed so they can watch it. And then they can ask questions to our under eight coach. That is at the moment the maximum what we can do. But we see that even in these times, the relationship gets better and better. Um, yeah, and, 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 and that is where we are standing at the moment, uh, Steve. Okay, fantastic. And Paolo, along a, a similar lines, uh, and I sort of picked up within your presentation, mentioned this, maybe it's just a subtle change from having like uh, affiliate clubs to, to grassroots clubs. But just wondered if, uh, yeah, you could give a bit more detail on, on exactly what that change entails. Is it just simply a, a change of name or... It's a way of getting a little bit deeper into the relationship with those grassroots clubs. Yeah, okay. Um, Inter Milan, the, the, the Academy of Inter Milan, uh, has always uh, run for the technical project like this and starting more or less uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, starting like uh, a lot of clubs, like uh, an affiliated program uh, when some uh, not professional club want to. Uh, work with us and collaborate with us for the grassroots level. But uh, uh, 10 years ago, we tried to uh, change this and try to develop and upgrade this. So we start to create the CDF. The CDF, uh, I said before, is a sort of a copy of our sports center of our academy. So uh, we try to select the club starting from our city uh, because now we have two. CDF in Milan and the other five in our region uh, because they, they have the same and the similar mentality about the grassroots level. So they want to uh, have an affiliation with us, but not like a, a commercial affiliation for the marketing project or for the brand new project, uh, but for the technical project. So we want to share the methodology, the technical project. Uh, our coaches help the coach of the non-professional club to develop and to discuss about the program and to discuss about the players. And uh, there's no secrets. There are no secrets uh, for the intermethodology. Is uh, uh, a lot of time happened this uh, that some ideas from uh, this club arrive in our club and try to develop uh, to change uh, a lot of things uh, inside. So it's uh, really important for us because. Uh, 
uh, this club uh, during the last 10 years uh, growing up a lot and uh, for the not professional club now they are elite club uh, and uh, there's a sort of uh, um, a really focus in their territory and uh, we, we start not for the scouting project because the scouts arrive later, but we want to develop the technical mentality to arrive for the scouting. And uh, for, the, for the IGP, is a little bit different because for the CDF, we have a technical director that directly works for Inter. For the EGP, it's not the same, but uh, uh, my position is to coordinate everything and all the technical staff try to go in the club and make the training, play a friendly match, uh, organize a webinar, organize a seminar, organize everything to develop the technical situation. So this is really important because uh, I don't know if uh, in other countries happen the same, but in Italy, uh, all the professional club organize uh, uh, affiliated program. But uh, Sometimes happen that uh, these affiliate program uh, they have to pay to have the, the benchmark. For us, uh, it's no pay, just for the technical situation, just for the technical program, and uh, it's really important for the non-professional club. In our region, Lombardia, we are lucky, but at the same time we are unlucky because uh, probably is uh, the most important region for the number of clubs, professional and non-professional. So the level is really high. Our competitor is our AC Milan, Atalanta, Brescia, Monza, Cremonese. So all the level of the professional uh, football world, and uh, is uh, most important for us. We can we have to the opportunity to compare everything: the methodology, the level of the players, the level of the coaches, and it's important for this technical project to scout new coaches in this direction because if we firm in this direction, okay, we have high-level coaches and not just players. The players are really important, uh, it's okay, but the coaches are really important to develop everything for the long-term time. Yeah, 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 fantastic. Yeah, we'll certainly be diving a little bit deeper into that development of coaches in a moment. I don't know whether to sort of bring back in Greg. Um, as a, a question here, Greg, anyway, from, from Ryan White. Um, I'll probably just paraphrase uh, a little bits of it because obviously you sort of mentioned, as you've said, uh, what coaching challenges you've faced in, in North Norway that most coaches probably wouldn't face anywhere else outside of Scandinavia, other than the obvious geography constraints which you've mentioned. Um, I just wondered, Greg, whether I could uh, maybe just paraphrase that. And, and obviously there's a lot of things, the way th that things are set up in... Scandinavia that that make it a lot easier for you to 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 communicate with 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 grassroots clubs. Yeah, I think um, the day to day life challenges of a coach in an academy, from my experience, the same because you're dealing with young young people and young people's challenges across the world are usually the same. So I think the actual challenges of the coach in terms of what they have to do every day are, would be very very similar everywhere. Yes, there are geographic challenges for us. But I think the biggest cultural difference I, I've seen in my, my limited time here is Norway is a very economically stable and comfortable country. And footballers in Norway don't get paid a huge amount of money compared to doctors or other people within society. So that burning desire to make it as a footballer, that intrinsic motivation that's so key, is sometimes lacking in some of some of the most talented technically or physically players, uh, gifted players. So I think some one of the challenges for the coaches is to constantly challenge our players intrinsically in terms of are they are they driven? How much do they want to be here? Is it just the social? Or are they really prepared to dedicate what's needed? Um, but also to ensure that selection of players is based upon that, because if we don't get that bit right, we won't have the players breaking through the glass ceiling that's needed. I think that the other question you asked about that communication to, to clubs, uh, I recognize a lot of the stuff Jan, Jan and Paolo have talked about already. In fact, I've written down two ideas that I'm bringing straight back. Jan, I love the idea that you 
ask each of your coaches to be responsible for three or four of the clubs. So that's so, certainly something we'll be bringing around the coaching table this week. But I think um, one of the big things we did uh, prior to me coming to the club, maybe four years ago, is into the partnership agreement um, from 13 to 16. If a player is sold by Budaglim, the club partner club gets 5% of the transfer back. And the next step for us now, because that was brilliant, and for when a player like uh, Hawken Evian went to AZ Alkmaar last year, a small club that he came from got about £150,000 of, of that deal. Fantastic for them. More than a whole year's income for them. Amazing. But then the question we've been asked, and it's a fair question from some of our partner clubs, is that punishes the clubs here in the city whose players come to us at the age of 12. So we're now looking at a model that we can roll out for January where for every year a player spends at that club from the age of six to 12, they get 1% up to a maximum of 5%. So that if someone like Jens Petter goes to AC Milan and that deal was worth about 5 million euros, that partner club again would get a huge percentage of that. Because then it, 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 I recognise all of the challenges we've talked about today, but I think also we have to live what we say and, and look to give back to those clubs more than just time and things like that. And that's one very, very small way that you can get the, the partner clubs really dedicated to the cause. And then you also recognise that they have paid a, uh, played a small part in that player's development as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it brings us on nicely into that topic of through the grassroots networks, how you create those, those player pathways. And, and obviously that is a big help in terms of promoting that mentality that, yeah, you are part of the development pathway and, and, and seeing it from start to finish, not just that, you know, you feel as if you're in competition with these, with these clubs to keep hold of these, these kids. Yeah, definitely. And I think the, the, the unique thing about the Norwegian model is because players don't start in the academy to 30, we know the huge steps in technical development a player makes from the age of 7, 8 to 12. And we can't suddenly say, well, those steps just don't exist. They have to exist still. So we have to ask the clubs and trust the clubs to deliver that on our behalf. But then we also, I think, have to reward them when they are able to do that. Um, because I think also... For, for our partner clubs and those three players I showed on the left-hand side of the screen, two of whom didn't join us to the age of 16, if the geography is so big that they're not coming to us till 16, we have to also then recognise the work that that club does with them till 16. And let's not forget uh, this weekend when, when Holland was voted the, the, the most promising under-21 player in Europe when he won the award this year. He wasn't with a professional club till 16. He was with his grassroots club here in Norway, Plina, who have just won promotion to the championship, but they're still a, an amateur club in Norway. He was within part of that context or 16 when he went to Mulder under Solskjaer, who gave him his debut very early and then he made his progress from there. So, I mean, so yeah, very fascinating aspect of the development pathway in Norway. And one that's obviously very different to, to the two clubs we we're discussing with here today. Um, so, Jan, I think you've just kind of touched on that, that, that player pathway and how you've You've helped at least change the, the attitudes of the, of the community clubs around you, but how does it look physically? How do those players filter into your club at the different age group levels? Uh, to be honest, I saw, I saw one, of, one of the questions in, uh, of, of uh, Anderlecht uh, uh, coach about the DNA. And um, I think if, if you are aware what kind of player you're looking for and what, what, what kind of attitude uh, fits with your club. And I had uh, experience just before uh, that I was, was working at another club and uh, the recruitment came with a really good defender. Um, but that club where I work for, they want to build out of the back and, and want to play the possession game. But he, he was a really tough defender, maybe more like long ball, that very direct player. And at the end, of course, um, I was struggling like, OK, what well, I'm going to do. But I give the advice to the player and the parent, please don't take me wrong, but I think you have a bigger chance with that other club, which is a more direct club. and and at the end, and maybe that's just one example, I know, but that player made it to professional football by their academy. And with us, he would have been 
always out of his balance, always out of his strength. So to know your personal DNA and to know what kind of player uh, you 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 want to be, uh, you want to put in your academy, the the less chance you have that that you have to send them away after one, two, or three years. And that is that's the worst thing that we as professional clubs can do. That we look like a sort of a shopping house. Uh, then 10 in and then 12 out and then eight in and then five out. And that is how people sometimes look at professional academies. And uh, I think we all have, we, 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 we have things in common. We, we have the same responsibilities to deal well with young people who are in the, in the mid of their life. They're, they're, they're growing, they are developing their pers personality. And there's nothing more terrible than going from your beloved uh, grassroots club into a professional club where you make friends and everything. And then two years later, you're, you're sent away and you have to go with your head down to that club back. So we have a, a huge responsibility. And I think the more we work together with the people who are responsible in the grassroots clubs for the technical um, uh, guidance, so coaches and, 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 uh, men, and uh, academy managers, the better we, we can support that, the more chance we have that we get the right players and that we have a longer uh, system of recruitment. So we know more about that player, not just four or five training sessions, one game, and then, okay, here you sign and then you are a member of our club. No, a, a longer period of, of, of uh, recruitment. And from there, I think we will make better choices. And uh, till now, it's only two years, but it looks like that uh, we, um, uh, we get players in, but we don't send that many away. It's just two years, so I'm not gonna be selling a story of uh, success there. So uh, we have to look to a long term, but that is uh, something that, uh, that, that, uh, that helps a lot. And I think it's important that um, we uh, give those coaches, those talented coaches, uh, often we only talk about players, but those talented coaches who really are good in their job and you see that they uh, have opportunities to grow in that, that we give them a pathway. And one of the things that uh, we are able to uh, in um, Utrecht, that I'm starting this Wednesday, with the uh, UEFA C youth uh, course as a tutor. So I'm together with uh, one of the uh, tutors of the Dutch FA. And we have 24 coaches, but they all come from those aligned clubs. So we built an even stronger relationship with, with them because now I have 20 activities. So I can really understand where they come from and I can really influence uh, their personal uh, pathway. So, and, and I also uh, uh, hear some ideas from, uh, from uh, Greg and uh, Paolo where we can really learn from. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so that is what I want to say about understanding your personal DNA and, and know what your responsibilities are at, uh, as a professional club in that. I mean, Paolo, uh, just uh, picking up on some of those points there from Jan. Um, the structure you have with the grassroots that into Milan, it seems that that is built for keeping a large number of players within your system for a, a longer period of time. Yeah, we, we try to build this situation more or less uh, three or four years ago uh, to have much more time to work with these players. So we, we start the selection with under nine and uh, we, we have six years until under 14 to develop uh, and create uh, a player that uh, is really uh, ready to go in the next step for the under 15. And uh, uh, there are different problems. The problems are the, the first selection because we have to compare and have the competitor with other professional club. Um, I said before that during these six years, uh, the players change a lot for uh, a lot of things. And uh, uh, the mistakes that we made during the last years, uh, there's a lot because uh, you have, if you have to choose and we have to make a technical selection, 
uh, sometimes you can you can make a mistake. And uh, what's happened that the players said that we have to not confirm in your under 15. So this is a big problem. This is uh, the, the point that we discuss uh, in our technical staff uh, and we try to run in this direction. So compose a big group in the grassroots, uh, split in two and work together. When they arrive at the end of the grassroots level, and we have to choose uh, the best player for our under 15. Okay, more or less, uh, there are uh, 15, 18, 20. But if we have a group under 14 that's composed by 40, what's happened for the other 20? And uh, how our club decided, okay, more or less, other 10 or 12 players sign with us, but they play in a, in a different club to growing up and to have the possibility to play not just training, but play a game. This is a, a really important thing. And uh, if uh, during the next step, uh, I seen because I watch with my scouting system, with my technical staff, that some players that now play outside, they can come back and play again. Okay, there's an interplayer. It is really important because uh, uh, the period for a, a young player during the academy is uh, really long, it's more or less 10 years. And uh, all the clubs try to work to arrive on top in our first team, but in our first team, sometimes it's really difficult, but it's important to arrive in a pro world. So we try to develop the system. And during the last years, uh, we try to, um, try to form uh, uh, a big number of players. Uh, and uh, an example, during the, the last two seasons, more or less, we have uh, 45 players that go outside of our academy and play the pro world in Serie A or second division or third division. And so this is really important for the, for the market for our club. But uh, it's really important that if you choose a player for our selection, stay for a long time. And uh, the first step is arrive on under 19. And the second step is, okay, arrive in the, or for our first team or in a pro world. So, is is this the, the the challenge? Is this the is this the, the the work for our technical staff for now and for the future too? Fantastic, um, Greg. Um, sort of mo moving that along in terms of the coaching development. Um, and obviously, you sort of mentioned that up until under twelves, you are very reliant on on that foundation level of coaching coming from from the grassroots. Um, how, how has the club or the, the setup in Norway sort of able to raise the level of, of, of coaching at that foundation level, even if the players aren't sort of being directly involved with the, with the elite clubs? Well, we, we currently employ one person uh, whose 100% job is to do exactly that. So, we don't have foundation phase coaches as they might exist in other countries or under nine or under 10 coaches. Our, our coach's job is to do that, to work with those other clubs and to affect both the coaches and the players within those clubs. But we've realized that's maybe not enough. So we're in the process of trying to bring a second coach in for that because it's such a big job for us. And it's, it's absolutely vital for us that at, at under 13, the players are coming in with the correct technical level and we get access to the best players in the city for two years, 11 or 12, maybe three times a week while they still play for their grassroots club. So we are, we are getting to work with most of those players for a two-year period, but it's the players outside of the city that we have to work really, really hard with the clubs in terms of their coach development. And then a little bit also, like Jan said there, it's also supporting the uh, NFF's coach education program so that if they run a B license or a grassroots uh, trainer's license here within the county, we are represented at that and have a part to play supporting the coaches within that program. And how does that coach education look? Are you looking to directly share your methodology and, and get them to take on, on board sort of ways of, of developing players or is it very much you sort of cater it to whatever that club's DNA and whatever those coaches try to do by, you know, maybe just simply not hear some, Here's some training plans. You can use them if you want. If not, that's fine. Yeah, well, we, we, you can never force your ideas upon somebody. I agree completely. But I think 
the, the clubs would be a lot less structured than they are in the Netherlands or in Italy that we're working with. They wouldn't really have a DNA. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm being harsh in saying that. Um, but not only that, is our club's DNA is very, very clear. We play the same all the way through all of our teams, it, it, all the way to the first team. The coach, any first team coach here at Glimt has to play the same way of style of football. So although there are limitations to that, uh, as we've already discussed, if you find a central defender who doesn't fit that, then they, that might not be the club for you. But there are also huge strengths in that as well. So I think we, we, we find the clubs really wanting to know what we do and how we do things. Um, but to answer your question, no, we, 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 we give them a library of, of opportunity, opportunities to work with and they have to pick and choose what's right for their own context. Okay. Um, with, with Paolo, um, obviously Inter Milan sort of very, very different model where everything is, is aligned to the club. Um, so I for, through the technical directors, how, how that sort of level of coach education, how, how do you get your, how do you sort of train up your technical directors? So we, uh... We try to transfer uh, the most important thing about the grassroots level. So uh, our our coaches, more our coaches that work for our, for the grassroots level, are, are a sort of a, of a teacher uh, because during this period uh, the the guys and the players uh, needs to uh, learn uh, about our 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 transfer mentality and uh, uh, they changing a lot during this period. After, when they enter for the next step in the agonistic level, probably they, they need to, to discover different things about football from sometimes a, a, a normal coach, not like a teacher, because uh, they, they enter in a, in a world of uh, where they play 11-11 for the tactical situation, for uh, the, the, the football that run uh, for, for the first team. But... Uh, it's not always easy to find this uh, this situation because uh, I think that uh, in these two big group are, uh, are a lot of differences. So if, if you want to if you want to coach in a grassroots level, uh, you have the, the the passion of the of the the, the, uh, the transformation of the players, and when you work in agonistic level or with the first team. You have to the passion for for the result, uh, for the for the game, uh, for uh, to develop the every single player to arrive on top. So are for me di different different way, uh, different uh, conception of the role of the coach. Uh, so all, all the co all the coaches are the coaches in the academy, but with different level. So our for example, our coach for our under nineteen is really close uh, of the coach of the first team because uh, they work together and our under 90 is a sort of a, a second first team. Uh, for the other ages, uh, under 18, 17, 16, the younger two, uh, the most important thing is to transfer all the skills uh, about the ages and there are different skills about the ages. So I think this is really important for, uh, for an academy to build this sort of system. So ended with your regional centres, say at under 12 on, yeah. on any given night, if we were to, able to see every single regional centre on the same day, the training sessions, would they uh, look very similar or is there a certain level of autonomy that you allow to those individual groups that you can sort of train as you like or is it very... Like you say, that DNA is very strongly embedded in each of those centers. Yeah, a, a little bit similar, but we know that uh, there are differences from our academy, our grassroots level, and uh, a professional club. But I, I, I saw the, I seen during the, the last 10 years uh, that uh, the level is growing up. And uh, it's important because we, we speak the same language. So we try to transfer this. It's a, it's a really long work. It's not really easy to change uh, everything uh, in a short time, like uh, one year or two years. But uh, more or less every normal sports season, not during the last for the COVID problem, but a normal season, more or less, we made uh, 1,000 um, events with this club. 
So it's a lot of events. And in every event, we try to transfer the technical mentality of Inter, the technical program of Inter. And every non professional club, every regional club, try to develop, try to adapt of the system, try to check about uh, the system of the territory, because we speak always of the same region, but uh, you know that uh, every club has different uh, situations. So uh, we are happy for, uh, for what's happened now, but we want to develop again. Okay, fantastic. Uh, um, Jan, um, very interesting sort of setup you have at, at Utrecht, there's one that sort of Greg picked up upon, and, and I'll sort of invite Greg if he wants to ask you any further questions about it, but your role, your dual role, where obviously you're the head of coaching at FC Utrecht, but you're also sort of involved with four of the grassroots clubs. Um, and I just wondered how that, your relationship with the coaches in those clubs, how, how you get that balance of those clubs, as you said, will have their own individual DNA and how you share and maybe integrate the Utrecht way with what they're doing. Um, yeah, so so uh, the philosophy of the club of my work within the academy, so with my coaches, is that uh, we have 12 head coaches and then we have uh, uh, three times as much assistants and that are all volunteers and they all come from regional clubs and they invest a lot of time just for a training shoot but also for their personal development. So that means that uh, I always, yeah, that's maybe not so nice to say that, but, but I really believe that that works. I see that it works, is that I say to my coaches, put more energy in your personal development than in your job. And then they say, are you, are you crazy? Uh, you're you're, uh, you're uh, talking from outside the club and you say that I have to put more energy in my personal development than in my job. Now, two years later, they say, ah, wait a minute. Now I understand what you do because at the moment that I'm at the club, I'm better educated. I know where my strengths are and my weaknesses. I know how I have to develop my assistant coaches who are all volunteers and build relationships. And at the end of the time, I'm inspiring for my colleague coaches. So my, my, my other coach can also learn of me. So I'm more like uh, trying to organize sort of a template that the, the development of the coaches can find each other because not everybody is, is of course has the same qualities and the same motivation to go in certain things. Um, now, one of, one of the things that also happened is that uh, in total, we have 22 uh, clubs where we have uh, a club coach uh, related to. I'm, I have four. And the, the general thing what we do is an intake, an action plan, and the execution and the evaluation of that. And we only work with three points, uh, three, three points of interest. Because if you do more, then you have to spread the energy about five or six things and then you know that that's not going to be successful and then we get from 22 different clubs we get the action plan with all the topics and then we say ah wait a minute there is a lot of uh, emphasis on that point and then we make an overall activity of it so that everybody can join even those smaller clubs those those, those really small clubs can join so that is for everybody and uh, the first year we could do it at our academy or visiting a club. And now we have to do everything by uh, video calls and, 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 web and webinars. So um, we all know that uh, a club is never the same. It goes up and down, up and down. Most of the technical managers, so the, so the academy managers, left their club last year because of one thing that is the struggle with team uh, uh, talent idea and team selection so who is who will be in the under 10 one and who will be in the under 10 eight and all those and because that are big big amount of uh, players and they were just 
they couldn't do their job anymore because there was so much moaning about uh, why is my son not in that team or uh, do I know what? And that made, so there you have a general point. So then you can work with each other about, okay, but how, how can you do that? And how is that? So what you do every day as a coach, except on game days, but that is running a training session. And the training session is constantly made by the train by the coaches. The coaches, they make it, they deliver it, and they evaluate it. And from there, you need information. One time a week, they coach a game. So that is the other topic that is important. That's a total different quality. Delivering a training session or uh, coaching a game. And then, most important, and, and I'm so happy that Greg and Paolo are exactly saying the same, that's the guidance of an individual player. That is the difference. And if you do that right, I'm 100% sure that at the end, you have less problems and you make sort of a, a, a sort of an area that people start to talk with each other about it. So parents become more, let's say, ambassadors of your vision than just fighting against your uh, decision because of individual purposes. And then you get more people who are aligned. And at the end, I was talking to uh, 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 Paolo just before, and he said, we can't play games anymore. Uh, but before we could play games, and how many games did struggle because parents and coaches were fighting and, and referees are, are uh, bad words are said to, to referees, uh, very poor examples. And now we can't play. And now we all say, oh, we hope we can play. So a very important role of us to give an example, be happy what you have, if you can play an opponent, don't see them as an opponent only, but see them also as a friend. You can practice your skills and you, 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 you can see how far you are at that moment. And if we, we keep on doing that, then of course it will be much nicer during the week, but also in the weekend when the games, yeah, when we're allowed to play again. And that is something that's a personal, yeah, I would like if, if that would be a little bit better than than we had before by all the 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 um, yeah the things we are organizing in in this time that that people are appreciating their opponent that they yeah that 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 that's it's a gift that we can play those games. And Greg, I know you uh, you expressed uh, an interest in in the relationship that. At FC Utrecht between the, the the coaches in the academy and and their their partner clubs. So I don't know if you wanted to sort of pick up on that at all. Uh, ask him any questions before I have a a, a specific question for you. Yeah, yeah, and I think you, you touched on it slightly there in your answer. But what what's been the biggest challenge you've had with say convincing your you've got a G, an under fourteen coach who's very competitive. And you're saying to him, I want you to go and be a coach educator and work with these clubs. Um, what's been the biggest challenge and how have you dealt with that? Now, to be honest, the one I was, let's say, scared of a little bit, like, oh, that's not going to be the right uh, 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 person for, for that club. That is, that's the one who is uh, on, on, on the apps because I'm also in those apps. So I see how many times he sends out uh, sort of an article or uh, a little presentation, but it also comes back. So we really communicate uh, that way. And that club was one of the clubs we, want to bring, we wanted to bring down from the pink to the blue. Mm. Because they, they are in an area that uh, they struggle with members, a mm. lot of diversity, sometimes things on the pitch that you think, okay, that shouldn't be there. Mm. But now it's growing again. I don't say that it's because of his... Um, uh, let's say relationship at the moment, but it's it it really helps because they can say FC Utrecht supports us, and what we say is also supported by FC Utrecht. And then often people say, okay, then we we understand. Um, uh, to come back on uh, on that that um, uh, competition drive of certain coaches, 
Um, when I was uh, when I was young, I I always thought that um, if you educate players, that's enough. Uh, and then okay, I have to put my personal uh, drive to uh, to go into games and and tournaments to to win. I have to put that a little bit aside. Um, but by being head of coaching now, I see the diversity of our coaches, and I can tell you there were some really coaches who 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 said how you work is not the right way and and we never get players in the first team the way you work so that was a closed environment i'm not going to say who it was and what they said but um that's safe um but now they see more the benefit of each other so they they i worked in many academies and i've been in so many clubs and often a lot of uh strength is lost by that coaches don't communicate with each other and that they see maybe each other as rivals or maybe, yeah, okay, I'm better than you. And um, that in Utrecht, you can't survive with that mentality. You have to show things of yourself in a way that other people like to learn of you. And when you are able to do that, then you are also helping our academy forward in, in, in the biggest sense. And that is something I try to uh, to organize. Uh, but then, of course, I'm in the background. I'm just organizing and they do the presentations, the coaches present to each other and they uh, present their personal learning points to each other so they can help each other. OK, you want to learn that. OK, we, we, we bring you to that pathway or that pathway. And that is all happening now because, yeah, we have time to uh, to create that, uh, Greg. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. So, yeah, Greg, you're kind of in that role where you, you kind of mentioned you have you have one coach who is there is your sort of connection with all the grassroots mm -hmm. clubs are at that sort of foundation level. Mm -hmm. And you're now looking at bringing in a, a second person. So I'm just wondering what are you see as being the, the key skills required of someone in that role? I think when we sat down and we, we, we asked ourselves exactly that question, Steve, I think that the key thing is that they have to have a passion and drive to do that. It can't just be an out of work coach who says there's a job there because otherwise the whole thing won't work because to dedicate the time that's needed and, and the expertise that's needed to develop grassroots coaches who are coming from work and they're dashing out their car to put, it requires a very unique skill set. So number one, they have to want to do it most importantly. Um, and then I think it's just an understanding of both pedagogy in terms of how players learn, but also how coaches learn as well. And if you've got someone who's got an understanding of pedagogy and a desire to be there, then I think everything else isn't irrelevant, but you can work on everything else. Let's see, I want to sort of follow up question with in terms of then how maybe there's a, a coach pathway that you're bringing in coaches in into the, the main building from from the region and just wondered how that sort of the town team sort of philosophy you have, which sounds very interesting to me that, you know, there's not a hierarchy there where, you know, just send us your players and we'll coach them, that you also bring the coaches in and, and they're running the sessions. It's sort of interesting then how, how, that, how that works for you. Yeah, again, I think like, like both Paolo, uh, Paolo especially mentioned it earlier, there will be differences in how some coaches want to coach. And again, it's not for us. We, we put a framework in place. Uh, and the framework's non-negotiable. But within that framework, you've got to allow coaches to have their own individual personalities and those personalities to shine through. Uh, and yes, that might not always be exactly our philosophy here at the club, but I'm not sure that's too important. And, and also, who am I to say what's right or wrong if it works for them as a coach? So I think you have to be a little bit flexible with that. Okay, great. Um, Paolo, in terms of, um, obviously there's a very clear structure in terms of how your grassroots, grassroots project works and, and how that model filters to the top for, for the players. Uh, how does that work for, for the coaches? Is there, are there opportunities for, for coaches to move from grassroots clubs into the regional centres and, and into your main elite building in Milan? Uh, yeah, 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 they have always the opportunity to move. 
Um, it's a, a part of their job uh, because uh, every every coach have a have a, have a group age. Uh, for example, under 10, 11, or thirteen. But uh, the club invests a lot of time and and, and passion about the, the technical project for the for the regional club, and. Uh, they they try to uh, transfer everything we try to discussion inside of our technical staff to transfer outside and uh, it's not always easy because uh, um, the, the regional club uh, sometimes have uh, different problems about uh, the connection with the other uh, local clubs around there and uh, I said before that we have a, a very big competitor with the other professional club that make the same thing and try to scout the best talent that they have. So uh, the, the important work is in two directions, transfer, technical and training methodology when they move in and try to understand which are the best talent inside and try to conserve inside because uh, uh, every season, uh, every player, I don't know if they happen in, in, uh, in Holland or in Norway, but in Italy, every season, every player is trying to move in a different club because they have to sign, but after one year, they can move. So it's important to create a, a sort of a, a fidelity system and try to create a, a, a thing uh, a thinking mentality about inter club is not easy. It's not easy because uh, now the, the society is changing, and uh, every player they play football, you want to arrive on top, and you can arrive on top with Inter, with AC Milan, or with a, a professional club. So uh, the work is not is not easy, but it's so strong. And when our coaches move in the club, they try to transfer all these things. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, yeah, and sort of Paolo picking up on some interesting points there. It's not a case of um, your coaches that you're working with have opportunities to move in within your within your organisation, but particularly as you mentioned, you're also in an area where there's a lot of competition from other elite clubs. So it's a, another battle just to keep people within your building. Yeah, the the the. the um happened that uh, our, our championship is a, is a regional so uh, sometimes happen that uh, our our um, our group uh, organize a, a championship match or a friendly match against this club but uh, we try to transfer the mentality of the the challenge not uh, the, the mentality of okay i have to win all the players want to win all the coaches want to win but the differences are uh, What's happened later? If I win or if I if I if I lost the game, and uh, it's important to transfer this because uh, when they arrive on top, sometimes happen the same situation but uh, in a different way. But in the grassroots level, the most important thing is not if we always win on draw or lost the game, but if we uh, how many things we try transfer about the game. It depends if we we, we won or lost. So it's not always uh, easy to understand this, but we try to do this. Oh, fantastic. Um, Jan, um, you sort of mentioned you're also in a, a very competitive region. Um, well, you, you know, uh, if you look at the, uh, the map of Norway, <laughs> and then you look at the map of the Netherlands, uh, then you see that uh, everything is is less than an hour away uh, in the Netherlands, especially when you're exactly in the heart of the country. Um, that is, of course, very good when you're in the heart because longer than an hour, it's not. But that also means that they also can come and get, get it from us. And um, what I always believe is uh, in this system, there are people knocking on the door. So like if you look at the, the, the club system, that it all pushes to a high level. So we want the whole pyramid to be on a higher level. So when we get youth players who can really go into our first team, who wants to challenge the top three. 
So that is not, that's not uh, an easy job for those kids, I mean. So that means the level of the coaches go also up. They, 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 they must be better, uh, let's say, now than four years ago. Because four years ago, it was okay to be in the top six as a club, um, a club goal. Now they say we reach higher and we want four players every game in the, in the team. Academy players, old academy players. And eight academy players, standard eight or ten, have to be in the squad. So they really say, okay, and maybe not because of the money, but the place that we are situated in the Netherlands, I think that is a realistic goal. Because we have so many players in a, in a multicultural uh, environment. So we have everything here available. So if I want to keep the coaches, you can do two things. You can say, okay, I keep you small and then you stay with me. Or I can say, okay, become as best as you can be as an under eight coach, or you're so good in not only under eight, but you're also able to do other age levels that you can make, but I can't pay you anymore. So I'm happy for you to go to another club. Like I had the chance personally to go from club to club and from FA to club again and in the uh, academy manager and tutor and just to develop myself. And to be honest, the last two years, I learned so much what I didn't know. So, and I, I thought already that I knew a lot. <laughs> so, um, so for me, um, this is the way we want to give talent a chance. And I'm not the one who decides how far you can reach. If you want and you're motivated and you want to learn, I want to help you. This environment wants to help you. Everybody wants, wants to help each other. And if all my coaches, oh, sorry, the coaches of FC Utrecht are working in five years with top clubs, I'm the most happy person you can have. Because I know there are 200 coaches standing in line to take over their job and they know that it's a challenge and it's not much paid. Sorry, that's not, uh, that's not how it works. But uh, we give you an education, we give you the opportunity to grow, and that is what we want to do with this whole region. That's the philosophy, uh, Steve. Uh, and, and similarly with, with, with you, Greg, how, how does that situation look at, at Bodo Glimt? In terms of players, that there we don't have any competition. So it's a very unique situation. Uh, again, when I worked at Norwich, it was a little bit like that because we were stuck out in the middle of nowhere. But but here especially, we just don't have that challenge challenge for players. So it's quite a safe environment. Our best under 16 player might have some international interest, but apart from that, there there, there wouldn't be anything within the country because the geography. For coaches, though, it makes it very very difficult because um, I think we we don't have a huge coaching population um, within the north of Norway. Coaching as a full time vocation is quite new. So quite often we've said, look, we really want to find a Norwegian person for this role. We haven't been able to do that. So we've had to go international. The club may have had to do that when they brought me in. I don't know. But I think for us now to ensure that we have a good talent development pathway for coaches is absolutely vital um, because we can complement from outside the club and there should always be a small percentage of turnover. But equally, you need a core group of people who are going to be there for some time, especially in a society which is a lot more static as it is here in Norway. Uh, I'll probably say with you as well, Greg, for, for this cup final round of questions. Um, I think it'd probably be wrong that obviously the situation we've sort of faced in, in all of our different countries um, with, with COVID. Obviously it brought challenges, but also sort of opened up new opportunities. Uh, I think you've touched on one or two, but what a what have been the bigger things in terms of being able to work with coaches around your, your region that you sort of opened up and, and will probably continue to use moving forward? Yeah, I think it's, it's access to technology and people's willingness to use it has been a big one for us. Uh, and mentioned already, it's gratitude for realising what we have and what we're lucky to have when sometimes we bemoan those things. 
Um, and secondly, I think it's just allowed a lot of our players to play in a less competitive environment this year, which has suited some, not all, but suited some, and allowed some players to come to the front that we maybe weren't expecting to. Um, Paolo, for you, obviously you're sort of back in, in lockdown with, with Inter Milan and, and not having that connectedness with, with your players, but sort of over this really hard period of time, what are the, what are the things that you've kind of learned that you'll be able to sort of take forward to, to better times? Yeah, it's, it's difficult now because during the, this, the second lockdown for us, uh, it's not a, a, the same lockdown like in, during the, the, the last month, but uh, similar. Um, so we are lucky because now in, in, in this moment, the technology had them and we try to have the, the, the communication about this uh, uh, Zoom video call uh, or with the WhatsApp group uh, or some events uh, with the, with the tablet, with the, with the technology, but it's not the same. And uh, uh, we try to transfer th this mentality. Okay, at the moment, you can move outside of your room and uh, create a sort of a training. It's not training, it's just to move and play something. If you have the possibility to play with the ball, it's okay, perfect. If you have some problems, uh, okay, don't, don't do this because it's sometimes uh, uh, dangerous uh, or uh, it's enough no, for this moment. And uh, uh, the problem for, for some of our families is, okay, uh, the school is a problem, uh, the sport is a problem, so what can I do with my son? And uh, uh, we try to transfer always this thing, positive mentality, and uh, probably this uh, worst period uh, uh, close uh, the next, uh, I don't know, I hope, two months, three months, and come back to the reality. Uh, but uh, I think that the big problem is not for the youngest, but probably is for the, the, the age that probably Jan or Greg said before, 2003, 2004, 2002, because they arrive close to on top and want to uh, catch the possibility to arrive in the pro world. So, they, they have a sort of a different, uh, different training at home, but for the youngest, it's uh, really important to, okay, stay at home, make something uh, similar to training of football or uh, other sports. Uh, and when you come back, uh, probably you have a really full of energy that you can catch out uh, and uh, play for all the time. So we try to transfer this mentality for, for our players. For the staff, uh, a little bit different because during the last lockdown, we produced a lot of uh, materials uh, with the webinar, with the, uh, with the video call for the technical program, for the methodology. Now we make the same, probably with not the same pressure, but uh, it's important to, to continue this because uh, it's important to, okay, we are ready when the, all the situation come back to the normal life. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and finally, Jan, um, similar sort of question. Obviously, uh, there's a lot that will be taken on board with the, with the technology, but I think it was also interesting with Greg and Paolo also picked up that maybe, do you rethink uh, your ideas on competition? That sort of this lack of games as you've seen, noticed sort of increases in development in, in different types of players? Yeah, well, you... you uh, that's the, that's, that's the same with practicing penalty kicks for a Champions League a final. You, you can't practice that on a training pitch. So I think competition puts something special to, uh, to the environment. And now, yeah, we always say in certain ages we shouldn't, we shouldn't do competition. I'm, I, I think we should teach parents and coaches more how to deal with a competition because the game is invented in uh, your beautiful country um, because of you want to play to win. That's the game. That's, that's, that's the idea of the game. And that the people who are joining the game, that they want to win, okay. But how do you guide that? How do you help that? And, and that is, for me, a uh, more important uh, scene now. What I saw internal, uh, internal in the academy is that we have visualized our playing style and training sessions 
in a better way. So we filmed more and we we cut we cut it more and we we we, we uh, align more like if we want to play out of the back in this way, then we have to train similarly in training sessions, and that is maybe something we uh, we could grow and that is what we use this time for and the other thing is that i was not so happy with the uh, outcome of the individual uh, development meetings with with players so the the meetings were all right but the follow-up was not good enough so uh, six weeks later they had another uh, review and then yeah they look back on the points they said we would work on and they almost didn't work on those points. And now I see that that there is a better uh, follow up from those individual learning points into a day by day session and also the participation of the players themselves. So it's not only that uh, the coach is preventing them for them, but it's also more the players are also uh, in the lead to to work on those points, and we give more time and space to uh, to that. So that is that is uh, what happened uh, in the last uh, few months. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks a lot, Jan. It's been uh, it's been great chatting with you again today. Well, uh, thank you for having me, and um, thank you, Greg and Paolo, to uh, to to uh, to share your thoughts. I <laughs> I learned so I always learn more from these meetings than reading a book. Maybe I, I don't read the right books, but this was brilliant. <laughs> and thank you, Greg, uh, Steve, to uh, to to set this up again. Uh, it's a it's a real pleasure to work to work with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, Paolo. Uh, a big, big thanks for you for, for joining us today and, and sharing your your work at Inter Milan. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Jan and Greg. It's a pleasure for me because uh, every time I have the possibility to share and, and to speak about football for, for the for the grassroots and academy level too is is really important because uh, uh, I think that. Uh, we, we always try to, to, to keep and try to discover new things uh, and the, the, the world now is around really fast uh, and the football is really, really continue changing. So it's important to, to develop and share everything, everything. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paolo. And, and finally, a big thanks to, to Greg Broughton. Uh, thanks for, for joining us today, Greg, and sharing your work at Bodo Glimt. Hey, thanks for hosting and thanks for everybody for joining and as the others said, Jan and Pana, thank you for sharing so openly. I've certainly taken a lot from it as, as I always try and do, uh, but I've got a sheet of things here written down, which I'll be taking in to try and action uh, as we as we start next week. But uh, yeah, it's been really, really productive. So thanks for everybody. Okay, and finally, we'll see everyone's uh, going to be uh, Bodo Glimt fans for, for this evening. Wishing you the club all the best and hopefully thank seeing you. a first title tonight. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.